Welcome to Investor Masterclass, where in this episode, I interview the CIO of RTM Capital Advisors and regular on the platform, Mark Ritchie II. Now, here's the thing. We at Real Vision do our very best to stress one fundamental point which we believe cannot be said enough. Investing is a very personal thing. If you want to make money trading over a long period of time, your approach to it really does depend on who you are, what you want, and what your background is. And the reason we stress it so much is that within reason, anyone can be a great trader as long as they understand just that. But it takes time, it takes discipline, and above all, it takes framework, which is really what this series is focused on helping you build. Now, with that in mind, that's why this masterclass, although very useful to individual and professional investors alike, is particularly valuable for those who aren't taking the traditional path from Ivy League school to Bulge Bracket Investment Bank to the buy side. The great thing about Mark's story is that he didn't go to the fancy school or get an MBA. In fact, he started working for a rogue trader. He lost everything, literally, and then had to start all over again, teaching himself from scratch without a finance degree or blue chip firm on his resume. And how on earth did he do that, you might ask? Well, let's find out. Mark Ritchie, welcome back to Real Vision. We're in your hometown of Chicago. I think at least it is your hometown. Close enough, yeah. Close enough? Are you just outside? Um, now, I say welcome back because you've been on Real Vision uh, many times before. In fact, I was thinking you're one of the few people who's been both an interviewer and an interviewee. So you could probably even conduct this interview yourself. But I'm here to, I'm here to help you out. Um, so this is a, an investor masterclass. So what's going to be different about this chat is... I'm not going to be asking you about your views on a particular asset class or a particular stock. What I want to get into is how you came to your process or how you got to your framework. Um, You know, how do you think about how does an idea make it into your portfolio? Uh, What does the position look like during its duration? How do you exit and talk about the psychology of that, uh, which I'm interested in. And uh, but before we get into that, I do I would like to know how you started in the world of, uh, of investing. Sure, how far back do you want to go? Uh, well, thanks for having, <laughs> thanks for having me. Um, humbled to be here. Uh, obviously, love Real Vision and everything you guys are doing. Um, grew up in a trading family, of course, which some people may or may not know. Um, the irony, of course, is I didn't actually learn about markets a whole lot from my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, which may surprise people, I don't know, but... You he, should probably say your father is Mark Ritchie, market wizard. The, the greater, Mark the greater, as he's always... Oh, okay. always <laughs> that's what he would, he would self-referentially, of course. Keeps Christmas happy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, he, uh, yeah, was in market wizards, uh, really more of a floor trader. Um, and then, you know, here, I mean, we're only a few blocks from the old Board of Trade CME, yeah. so that's kind of where, yeah, he cut his teeth in the 70s and 80s. I was pretty much retired by the time, uh, you know, or at least off the floor, not doing uh, active trading of that type. Uh, one thing I would say, though, even, you know, as I've reflected on all this, you know, how much, how much of, you know, anyone's skill is innate or is it intuitive? What is learned, what right. is not? The old nature versus nurture. Those are mm-hmm. fascinating debates. I grew up, you know, in a family with five kids, and I have the test scores to prove I was probably the least intelligent in terms of those, those metrics. No way. Uh, but we played lots of games. <laughs> and I think that was probably more so than anything a really interesting backdrop. I heard Paul Tudor Jones make this point mm-hmm. a few years ago that he was like a game junkie. I could relate to that, at least in the sense of probabilistic theory in practice as you're kind of working things out. For me specifically, though, my older brothers especially were more intelligent than, than me when it came to certain strategy games. Mm-hmm. And I tended to do better where there were elements of risk involved or where you were more comfortable kind of going out the risk curve a little bit. And those types of games, I would usually either finish first or dead last because, right. you know, depending on how those, <laughs> those risks work out, uh, where a game like chess, mm-hmm. if, you ha- if you are more intelligent, have superior strategy, you will beat me yeah. every single time. Yeah. So that was kind of 
you know, so something. Like from a very early age, you uh, were interested <clears throat> in risk-adjusted returns. You, you, you could kind of quantify risk. Even uh, yeah, I certainly wouldn't have used that language then. <laughs> and the other point I would make, though, is if you're going to be in this business, I think you have to be comfortable mm. playing against people who are smarter than you. Right. Or who certainly on the surface are much more intelligent, maybe more eloquent, mm -hmm. and have different views or opinions than you do. If, if that's going to intimidate you, you're gonna, you're gonna, or you're gonna change your mind every anytime someone you feel is smarter than you has a different view. Right. You're gonna have a problem. Right. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting, you know, aside. Um, but do you th do you think your journey into the world of finance was inevitable because of what your father did? Were you interested? Absolutely in it? not. No, couldn't have been. I couldn't have been less interested <laughs> okay. in it in terms of, uh, you know, when I was in you know high school or that that type of thing. Even in college, um, you know, I have a philosophy degree, which generally you don't see that in a lot of. Mm -hmm. PMs. Uh, it's actually one thing we have in common. So uh, we're, <laughs> right, we're two, two of the few. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we could probably pontificate on all manner of uh, less interesting things. But no, I, you know, just I got out of uh, college thinking I was going to go into some type of actually non for profit ministerial work. I went, I went to work for a church for a few years, ironically, and didn't care for that experience. Uh, not the faith side of things, but just felt like maybe this isn't the career for me. And kind of fell backwards in just into working for an old associate of my father's. My dad, yeah, as I said, had been retired. And that ended spectacularly horribly, mm -hmm. which I'm happy to get into. Mm -hmm. um, but I kind of got the trading bug while I was working there. Well, what, what's interesting about you is, um, I mean, a lot of people watching, they may have taken a more traditional route into the world of investing and, and uh, the, you know, whatever, whatever it is, the finance schools, the MBAs. You are kind of a bit more on the unique side because you kind of learn all the job. But uh, well, that's what I'd like to ask you about. Like, how did you sort of learn without a real background in finance? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I've been very blessed to have a few good mentors along the way, which I can get into. But trial and error and sort of yeah. school of hard knocks, I guess, you know, I don't like that term as we like to think about it, but just trying to figure out, can I figure out what works mm -hmm. in the market? So I was, I was working for this, who I thought was a trader, uh, sort of back to the story a little bit, okay. and, and then trying to figure out, I'm not sure how this guy's ever made any money, uh, hmm. because it just didn't, he didn't seem very disciplined to me, he didn't seem like he had a process, and you know, he would say, one, well, I'm gonna do this, and then he changed his mind, but not for what seemed like, just all kinds of things like that, and so I just kind of, I was sort of being paid. I wasn't being paid to be a trader. It was more of just like a glorified assistant order right. enterer type. But then just kind of, why is this moving and not that moving? And uh -huh. why, why is this market, why are more people buying today than selling? Just all those types right. of questions. Mm -hmm. And then reading books. And then obviously, you know, talking to, <laughs> talking to guys like my father from time to time. And, you know, Getting the bug, yeah. kind of. But it's, it sounds like you got into the more of the psychological aspect of trading. I mean, you didn't start by doing bottom-up analysis. I'm guessing you didn't like spend hours poring over uh, balance sheets and income statements. Uh, it was more like, <laughs> why is this stock? It's more like behavioral economics meets meets trading. And I, I certainly wouldn't have used any of that language then either. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't really in our shop even now to some degree. But that was certainly a part of it. And I can get into you know, my journey into some of the psychology of trading as well. But I kind of started developing some of my own ideas that I wanted to try. Mm -hmm. And so it was really just more a function of how do I, how do, I do this? Right. Um, so, so I want to get on to the psychology of trading a bit later on. But just I, I've the, got a good anecdote for that as well that I think Oh, good. Really, so. make, make sure to remind <laughs> me. Uh, but let's talk about your first steps into the world of um, First of all, would you consider yourself an investor or a trader, or is that something that changes kind of day to day? It, well, it has changed. It is. I'm, I'm both, but and I could get into that more. It's it's it started more as trading, uh, specifically because that's where I felt like I could turn my edge over fast enough. Right. So to finish up the story, basically that whole endeavor ended terribly. As, as bad as it could possibly be. I think we need to hear this story uh, now, well, it's cropped up. <laughs> just, you know, imagine turning somebody that you know really well into the feds, because not only were they not apparently good at trading, they, you also discovered some fraud. Okay, uh, now, you then, know what, now you know how he was making money. <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> um, and so not only am I going on my own, I'm relieved of any of the money I had at the firm at the time, oh, or the, the tiny little, so it was about as bad of a beginning as you could possibly get. 
And the story was basically, I just went to, I went to my dad actually, and I said, look, I've got some ideas. Now, now I don't have a resume, because who's gonna put, you know, working for a <laughs> soon to be convicted criminal on, the, on their dossier, Yeah, and, you know. I should, I, you know, my other business partner probably kill me for even sharing this, but we'll, <laughs> we'll leave it in if you guys want. But it was more this idea of, all right, um, nothing like a little desperation mm -hmm. to, to give something a try. I mm -hmm. borrowed a hundred grand from my dad mm -hmm. and he basically said, well, you got some ideas, go for it. And, but if, if you're in the old, you know, line, if you're faithful a little, I'll give you a little more. Right. Um, so so the there was a little, that. there was a little bit of access to sticky capital, if you will. Um, and I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to be, and mm. so I kind of started out with a couple different strategies with the idea of I'm just gonna do more of what's working. If this is working, I'm gonna do more of it. Right. Uh, and I really started almost completely quantitatively. I had a few models I'd kind of created that I felt like, well, if nobody would interfere with these stupid things, maybe they'd make money. Right. And then very quickly I realized <clears throat> I don't want to be a quantitative <laughs> trader, because then I'd see a market doing something and I'd have a view. Yeah. And while I was a quant, you, you can't do, you know, traditionally it's like you just set the thing and you follow the rules and let, let it do its thing. And that was just not me. Um, well, you said a couple of things earlier which um, I wanted to bring up. The first guy you were meeting with, um, the guy who may now be in jail, but you said he didn't have a process, he didn't have rules, he didn't have a framework, and you could tell that it wasn't working. And it feels to me like you noticed very early on that they were things that you needed to have yourself. So when you had your first 100 grand, you were like, okay, now I need to try and establish some, some rules for myself. So you, you basically did trial and error, smaller amounts, I'm guessing, see what worked, and just kind of push the pedal when you saw something working. Yeah, that, that's, that's a pretty good way of describing it. And it was uh, sort of like a genesis uh, of uh, like anything else. Mm -hmm. There was some, an evolution involved. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I stumbled on was just kind of swing trading equities. Yeah. Predominantly from the long side. Yeah. I did some shorting, but found that I was just making more money trying to catch turns yeah. uh, or when, you know, stocks were kind of meeting certain criteria. That's where, you know, I can bring in, you know, one of the mentors you know, who, who's taught me a lot is Mark Minervini. Some people know that name, he was in Market Wizards as well. Right. Um, I kind of sought him out a little bit. He was, he had a much smaller following then that he does now. But some of, some of the things he teaches were really timeless, looking for low risk entry points. Right, uh, why, why don't you explain that a little bit? What do you mean by a low risk entry point? Well, meaning where I can back into the risk knowing how much I'm gonna lose, and I know relatively quickly if I'm right or wrong. Right. So I don't have to hang around in this position, like a longer term investor would, mm -hmm. you know, for their thesis to kind of play out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really, I allocated to a few of these strategies and by the end of my first year, uh, two of them had made triple digits in terms of return, but wow. the irony was they were the two strategies that I had funded with the least amount of right. overall capital. It's often the case. Sure, uh, but it, it became relatively clear to me yeah. that if you continue to go, if you continue to have an edge here, yeah. which I obviously did, good things will continue to happen. So yeah, my the, really the the strategy was how quickly can you, you turn the profit over as fast as possible so long as there weren't liquidity constraints, right. which I ran into later uh, because some of these edges in the market are, are this big. Right. So, <clears throat> they, so that, they so might be fine for one guy, but if you, if you, you know, you, some people can make 100% a year on a small account, but they're not going to be able to scale that mm -hmm. uh, to continue to compound returns. One of the common threads we've seen in this series is the presence of mentors, and Mark's no different. He sees the importance of them, but you can't just rely on great mentors to fall into your lap, especially if you aren't following that traditional path. So that's why Mark took it upon himself to go out and seek the help of people like Mark Minervini. Also, Mark learned through trial and error. After figuring out that his first employer wasn't going to be much help, to say the least, Mark started to formulate some of his own ideas and put them to the test. Some worked extremely well, but many didn't. And that's when he learned his first rule of trading. If something isn't working, stop doing it. And if it is, keep doing it until it doesn't work anymore. It's simple, but for him, it was effective. Some of the other important realizations Mark made in those early years are both about himself 
and hard truths about the market. He wasn't even the smartest kid in his own family, and there's always somebody that is smarter than you, especially in the markets. So his answers to these issues were, one, there is a way to beat them, and often that is using effective risk tolerance. And two, that to be successful in a game where there are so many smart people, you occasionally have to be able to ignore them and stick to your guns. At the end of this section, we got into Mark's realization that he was a pretty good swing equity trader, and he wasn't really cut out to be a quant. And in the next section, we dive a little deeper into these topics and examine what works for Mark and why. Back to the interview. So we're getting into a few things I want to talk about a little later on, which is about what you do with an idea once it's in the portfolio. But if we could take a step back and talk about how does an idea get into the portfolio for you? Like when you, you know, I'm just thinking of people watching this, someone tells them a good idea. If you just go, oh, okay, that sounds like a good idea to me, and you buy, you know, a few thousand, whatever it is, dollars of it, if you're not paying attention to that person who is like telling you, then, then you are, that their, their opinion could change the next day. So you need to have your own reasons for doing it, your own framework, so that you can track it and follow it and have your own uh, strategy. So for you, I mean, not asking for example, but just a, a sort of a, a hypothetical, like you hear of a good idea, then what's the next steps that you take? Like, how do I size it? When am I going in? Sure. And this is true of, the point you made is true of everybody on every time frame. Yeah. Meaning I can give anybody an idea, but I can't give them the conviction. That's only going to come through right. running it through, hopefully, their own process. And that's one of the ways even I would recommend people use real vision. It's just an idea generator mm -hmm. that then you need to maybe you get a little more color on the fundamentals. Maybe you get, you know, you hear an argument for something you hadn't thought of before, but you you've got to take it through your process. There's no uh Believe me, I've tried. There's no fast way of making money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there's a lot of fast ways to lose it, too. Uh, it, well, and there's no fast way to keep it. Yeah. People, can, people mm -hmm. can make money quickly, but they often don't keep it. It's just the old, anybody can get lucky, but no one stays lucky. We used to have this expression when I was back running a portfolio. You always take the stairs up and the elevator down. <laughs> right. It's of course. Like, uh, that's, that's the equity markets, too, often. <laughs> you know, it's like you can wipe out gains very quickly. So back to your, your question. Uh, the first thing I would do is tend to look at the chart, of mm -hmm. course, the technicals. Um, but then I would look at, if, if, it's a, if it's an equity specifically, I would look at the earnings and the sales mm -hmm. uh, over the, the most recent quarters. Uh, if, it, if I'm completely unfamiliar with it, you know, I might look at uh, some of the fundament, uh, you know, bigger right. fundamentals in terms of what group are they in, who are their, are there other companies. Again, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more equity specific, but this could be anything. Generally mm -hmm. though, you know, if you called me and you're like, I like XYZ bond or commodity or whatever, I'm going to look at the chart first. Right. And so for, for me, and again... It, just, it tells a story, doesn't it, if nothing else. It says, this has been the history of the stock. Or sometimes there is no story, you know. And we can, mm. we can get into how I look at technicals, maybe versus uh, others. And No, I, I'd love to, to hear how you look so, at technicals. To me, technicals, and, and there's, uh, you know, in Mark Minervini's book, there's a chapter, I think, called The Picture's Worth a Million Dollars or something. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's it, his sort of his view on technicals. I would say is almost exactly mine. I have it. Um, the idea, though, is that technicals are the they are not the cause of anything. They are the effect. So anybody who says that well, this chart pattern causes this, no, it doesn't. Uh, I, I will be as concrete. I'm happy to argue <laughs> with anybody who wants to argue with All me right. on that. Um, what causes markets to move are buyers and sellers, and occasionally. A lot of charts, in my mind, are noise. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be disparaging towards other people's technical yep. disciplines, and I'm not claiming the way I look at something is necessarily better than theirs. And I've made this point before. You can send me technical work, and it might not make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's wrong, right. but I know what I want to see. Yeah. Um, and some of the best traders I know, even occasionally, will say, it just doesn't have the look. Well, that comes from them having looked at hundreds of thousands of charts over the course of their career. So you right. ask, what's right. part of our process? Part of our process is we screen through three to 700 charts a day yeah. manually. Uh, well, you back that out over a week and over, ten year, over the last decade, I've looked at over a million charts. Yeah. So I, my eye is keenly trained as I'm going through to say, okay, put this one on a different list. Mm -hmm. And 95% of it is kind of noise. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, that's one of the ways I'm filtering through. And I've had lots of people, why don't you automate this? 
Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> That's just the short answer. It's like, yeah, uh, if I interview someone, I need to meet them in person. I, I need to see the chart myself. I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it, it, maybe it isn't automatable at some point, right. but um, it's like it's like grading a diamond is the analogy uh, Mark right. would, Mark Minervini would use. Like yeah. even a master jeweler, like there's too many unique features on each diamond. So I want to go through by hand and look at these. Plus, as that is part of your process, you start to develop a feel and mm -hmm. a little bit of an intuitive feel for why are these groups acting well and these poorly and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, but back to my point, so if, if the chart looks terrible, I'm probably not touching yeah. it. But yeah. let's say you've got a, you, you've got an area of expertise. Mm -hmm. you, you really think fundamentally this is, a, this is a great area? Well, I may put that on another list right. just to take a peek at it every now and again to see if that chart you know, or the, the temperature of that market is improving. Or the, you know, I think of it like the weather. You know, I, I might want to go to the beach today, but if I go outside and it's just, it looks like it does you know, yeah. outside today here in Chicago, I'm not getting my swim trunks and my, you know, onto my towel out. I'll wait. But, but, but let me ask about this, because do you sometimes look at a chart and you say it's not for me right now, but if the fundamental story really makes sense to you, do you have positions in your portfolio which is like, okay, this is, this is Mark Ritchie the investor. I don't know when this is gonna work, but it is gonna work over six months. And then it's like, you know what? I'm gonna, this chart means I think I can make money over the next week. And this comes back to the idea which you know, I used to think about all the time is like, my job is to make money as much as I can over 12 months. Um, so I need to have whatever in the portfolio is get the best risk we're rusted to George over a time period. And I think people do get that, that time period thing so significant. So how, can you talk a bit about that? Like, do you have positions in the portfolio with very different time horizons? And do you have things in the portfolio where it's like, I think I can make money quickly? Uh, certainly, yes is the answer to both. However, generally though, I would never just buy something if the technicals are terrible, but I like the fundamentals. So to your example of, yeah, this is probably going to work in a year, but the chart looks awful. I'll just, I'll wait. I, yeah. I would rather pay up right. to know that the window, the wind is at my back yeah. than to sit there and, and buy. If it's so great, Jamie, why is the, why yeah. is the market saying otherwise right yeah, now? Yeah, I know what you mean because, I mean, if it makes 50% over 12 months, you're much better off waiting until it's moved, missing the first 10 or 20. I'd rather grab the easy 20% in the meat of the move. Okay. Um, now, to your point though, you know, as, as someone, there's an old saying in trading that you don't want to let a losing trade turn into an investment. This is exactly what I wanted to ask you about next, but go on. Um, but you can let winning trades turn in, into an investment. And this is precisely oh. one of the things we do from time to time. So, and often how I will play themes or positions out for a bigger move. So I'll give you an example. Let's say, to your example before, I think this is gonna move over the next couple of weeks. There's, there's a chance to generate alpha. Maybe mm -hmm. It could be in a specific sector or maybe a, a stock. And you time it just right. You nail the timing. Uh, well, if I'm at a multiple of my risk, meaning let's say I was thinking if it, it's gonna move and I'm gonna take a five or 10% stop, mm -hmm. the, the stock has now moved 30%. I'm at a multiple of, of my expected gain yeah. relative to my risk. Well, I can take off half to three quarters of the position and now finance the ability to hold that remaining position at right. no cost. Right. Now, it doesn't mean it won't uh, potentially it. move the P&L around, uh -huh. but as far as I'm concerned, I've now, I've now paid for that investment in full if I move my stop to break even. Uh, so that is something I do regularly. Uh, and now some of that has also been born out of looking at my own results, mm -hmm. which is another thing. <laughs> I think everybody, I don't care how long you've been trading, you should be looking at your actual trades and, right. and looking for patterns either that, that you yourself see or patterns in the market. And they Do you mean go back and criticize yourself and say, let's be really honest. Exactly right. Did I, was, did I get too emotionally attached to that trade? Or why in the world did I, why did I sell yeah. that there? Or, I mean, you should be, you should be tracking that stuff in semi real time anyway, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Or having someone do it for you. Yeah. Uh, if you have a bigger shop. But if, certainly if you're starting out, uh, this is, I cannot, overemphasize how important it is. And, I've and I could, just realized that I wish I had this interview about 15 years ago well, before my <laughs> career in portfolio management. I'm, I'm blown away at the number of people who either don't do this yeah. or um, some don't want to do it because they don't really, people like to be fooled. 
We like True. to fool ourselves into thinking we have a bigger an, edge than we really do. And there's an ego thing as well. It's like, if I'm in this game, I, I must be smarter, smarter than the market, right? And then if you just keep going back and looking at your losers, it can be, you know, can hurt the confidence and this is a confidence game. So a, a perfect example, you know, in a story I can tell is, so after the first couple of years, I had had a, a pretty good data set of trades. Hundreds of trades, just swing trading, turning, not, nothing longer term. Nothing over, say, the span of a few weeks. Right. Months would be the, that would be like a long term hold. Uh, you know, which for <laughs> some guys is like, that's, yeah. you know, that's like, that's a short term trade. And so I just started looking at what did all my best winners have in common? Great. All of them. Um, not cherry picking, not, I mean, just kind of going through everything. And I noticed that almost without exception, they meet some of the same criteria that are written about in guys like William O'Neill's book, guys like Mark Minervini's book, even guys like Richard Love back in the 50s and 60s that have some of the, some of the larger winners in the mm -hmm. history of the stock market. Either they had earnings or sales, or they were part of some specific growth areas. That doesn't mean there weren't a few exceptions, but it was like, wow, 90% of the meat of the money I'm making is in this area. Right. And then you looked back and you saw, holy cow, some of these stocks went so much higher. Yeah. Uh, now, that didn't bother me, because I, again, I was just turning the edge over and trying to compound money, because I think, especially if you're small, and being small is an enormous advantage. And that is not something mm -hmm. I think most people understand or believe. You'll hear yeah. people saying, things, well, yeah, yeah. you know, these big hedge funds, <laughs> these big institutions, they're at a huge disadvantage because they don't have the liquidity. Oh, they have me. massive liquidity constraints. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, if I change my mind, e you know, even right now, our, our fund is very small. Our pool is very small. We can, we can get liquid so quick if we get and, and get back in just as quick. That is an enormous advantage. So after studying all that, mm -hmm. then I basically said, I, you know, we have got to figure out a way at least to try and, and hang on to some of these positions for bigger moves. One, yeah. for scalability reasons, because it's just, it becomes increasingly hard to grab 10% moves on less liquid stocks mm -hmm. where the pricing is inefficient, which is an opportunity, but so is the liquidity. Yeah. So you're... It, it becomes much, much more difficult. So to find those criteria um, was invaluable to say, not only does this validate what we're seeing in our actual trading, it validates what, you know, sort of yeah. other market wizards in the past have, mm -hmm. have been saying for, this isn't new information. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways in which we look at the world is to say, okay, if the stock meets a couple of these criteria mm -hmm. and we've got our timing right, yeah. we're going to try and play at least a portion of the position for a bigger move or maybe trade right. around the position. Right. Sell some of it, not all of it, and then depending on how it acts. So let's talk about that for a second because <laughs> um, this was something that I tried to do and I'd be interested if you had a similar technique. Giving price targets or, or stop losses to certain positions. Stocks trading at 50, you think it's worth 80 or whatever. I mean, do you put on a position and just watch it, try and make it to 80 before you do anything? Or if it has too quick a move up to 60, you take some off, or if it dips down, add more. So how do you think about sizing a, a position during its lifespan in the portfolio? Great question, and this is really, this is, the, this is one of the questions. Yeah. Uh, how do you... Because obviously a stock can move nowhere, but you've made 5% on it simply by trading it right. So yeah, and this is where I think a lot of people don't understand where people that have sort of these asymmetric returns at times, uh -huh. consistently, um, I'm not necessarily putting my head in that ring, although I think our records have been pretty good. Um, <laughs> the, this is done through aggressive sizing at opportune times. Yeah. So, uh, but there are times where, like you said, okay, if something just hits a target, I don't leave resting targets in the market, mm -hmm. per se, mm -hmm. but I always have some things at least in my head, or we'll, we set alarms, certainly in terms of certain levels. So one of the first things is, when is something at a multiple of our risk? But I, when I get into something, I always know where I'm getting out. Right. Always. Right. <laughs> not sometimes, so the, not most of the time, always. always. Okay. That is, if you want, one of the, one of the few commandments. You don't, you don't want to take the elevator down, is basically what you're saying. Well, or a good example, what if the elevator goes through the floor you wanted to get off at? Yeah, you're right. How do you, that's going to happen. Yeah. Especially if you're trading with tighter stops. Well, you better have a rule for that. Mine is just get out. <laughs> right. Or maybe you give yourself 
a little bit of time to say, is this going to bounce? But I am, I am out. I'm not hanging on. So, uh, yeah, one of the things, though, to your, to your question about what makes you hang on, what yeah. makes you hang on to one, say, versus another, yeah. uh, it's, it's a variety of things. But generally, if I, if the better my timing is, the more apt I want to potentially try and hold a piece of it. Mm. Because any directional trader I've ever known has, even, you know, of different skill sets, have said the best ones work the fastest or they put you under the least pressure. Meaning, mm. when your timing is really lined up, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't always mean you've grabbed the tiger by the tail, but sometimes you might have. Right. And that's one at least, so if I have three positions and I want to reduce risk, the one where my timing was the best is the one I'm most likely to hang on to. Right. Um, if, because do, if that do, makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that because sometimes if you follow a stock closely enough, you do get to see its behavior. It sounds almost a bit silly to say it, but you mm. see the way a stock moves and it will have a lot to do with the type of investors who are in it. Um, and so simply by watching a stock closely, you can, what I'm saying is the technicals around that, you can trade in and out of, and is that something you do? Yeah, yeah. We, so there are some positions, you know. The trade in a range and it's, it's Yeah, it's well, normally, normally it, you know, bread and butter for me would be like higher area growth stocks. Uh -huh. Uh, equity specifically, or uh -huh. even ideas. They don't necessarily, you know, an area like I know crypto is is in that bucket for me yeah. because it's just what is going on there is highly innovative well, technology. I, I, I really want to ask you about that because the because you look at that asset as as a growth asset, it's very interesting the way you look at it. And I know you've mentioned it in a previous interview, and we'll come to that. But just specifically about trading the sort of more mature equities, right? So a, a good example would be. As I, as I mentioned before, if, if a stock is part of one of the classic, what we consider growth groups, mm -hmm. and this is, again, laid out in, in some of uh, Mark Minervini's material, but it's, it's, it's not original. This was factor modeled going back to 1900 in terms of what are the biggest winners in the history of the stock market? Like, where, where do they come from? Not 100%, but where do, on average, most of them come from? That's the sandbox mm -hmm. I want to be in. It's technology, large tech overall. Right. So if you study the the rail stocks when Livermore was trading, mm -hmm. that was tech. That, that was, was tech high men. tech. Yeah. That was sexy, you know. Yeah. It was a brand new thing. Yeah. Airlines in the 50s, you know, these stocks that had these momentum. That's why people don't come stocks in the in the 90s. I yeah. mean, you you and I could go through when you think yeah. of tech, you got to think of it a little bit bigger than than just software right now or right. as people think of Yeah. Uh, like Tesla is such a good example. Everyone who's been ripping on it as a car company they don't, they, they've realized now that it's not a car company, I think. I'm not, I'm, and I'm not making uh, value claims on whether or not it's over or undervalued. But those type of names have huge moves. Consumer retail mm -hmm. is another area. Mm -hmm. um, fads. I love to trade mm -hmm. consumer fads. Why? Because it's just everybody's got to own this product. Yeah. There's no way you can price that sales and earnings power in fast enough. When people are on that, and I, I mean, you and I could talk from Peloton well, to Yeti to think of just some of these, you know, you know what? these retail. Can I ask pads? you about Peloton? Sure. Because I'm so interested in something you said in a previous interview. Peloton's share price was just, you know, stratospheric, and we. Uh, there's a part of me that thinks maybe the pandemic was the worst thing that could have happened to it because it just got way ahead of itself too quickly. Um, but you came up. You, you said the uh, the eighty fifty rule, the fifty eighty rule, yeah. fifty eighty rule. Yeah, sorry. Um, but basically, when it's a growth stock and it's got some kind of technology behind it that people think it's the first mover advantage, it's new. We're talking about at home fitness. Uh, everyone's going to have it at home, and they're like, "Well, if everyone in the world has one, then the growth rate is you know forty five thousand percent or whatever it is." And you start like doing these blue sky things. So there's a lot of people investors in there who are in there for that and then the first quarter where it basically says okay you know let's bring it back down to earth not everyone is getting one of these right now they may in the future then you know you've had this whatever 40 to 50 percent fall but how do you then look at a stock like that? i'm not saying peloton particularly <coughs> i'm just saying that because now it's a very different investor who's in that it's now probably a, a longer term investor who says i'm happy to wait five years for the share price to go up 100 percent because i think it will do that eventually but the the, the easy money's gone exactly right. that's well you know the, the other thing i would say with some of these uh retail type fads fads mm -hmm. 
by their nature yeah. die out. <laughs> so, so you want to be so, off, you want to be off that train yeah. before the fad. Yeah, you know yeah. when everybody wants the Peloton is when you want to be selling your shares. You know, buy not, when everyone's selling and sell when well, everyone's buying. Of course, that's an oversimplification. Yeah. but uh, I wouldn't tend to try and ride those trades for forever. And this is you know the whole point of the fifty eighty rule. And again, I didn't make this up. These are these are guys who I just mentioned before. This right. is part of some of their work, having studied all these you know these characteristics of these stocks going back mm-hmm. uh, a long time to say that 80% of them are gonna lose half their value. That tells me I either need to trade these with tighter, much tighter stuff. I don't wanna be around for the right. for that 80 or the 50 move, because yeah, 50% it of them like, that are gonna. <laughs> just don't take earnings risk, basically. Well, just, you know, and there's a whole, we, there's a whole other topic in terms of sometimes I like to take the earnings risk. You do? But I want, I wanna be, I wanna cushion. I want mm. profits to lean on Right. Certainly, if I'm trading it with size, I would huh. never hold a large position into earnings without a right. cushion. Right. Meaning, I've got no open P and L in this position, yeah. and because to your point, and sometimes in Crocs is a famous one back in 2007. I want to say. Okay. Huge fad. Everybody, you know, they were everywhere. The earnings absolutely smashed, and the stock was down. I mean, it was like 30 percent on enormous, vo- the biggest volume in the history of the stock. And right. of course, everyone's scratching their head, going, "But the numbers are so good." It's like. To your point, they've priced in every man, woman, and child on the planet owning Crocs. Three pez each. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> the move is over. Uh, you need rules for yeah. for selling. Um, I actually I had I have a friend I think who said uh, he he was managing that particular position was long going into that and literally they called his broker and they were like yeah we can't sell it for you right now. That's how many sell orders were like My God. just <laughs> like slamming the tape. Now we start to examine some of the more specific aspects of Mark's trading, which brings up a classic question. Is Mark a trader or is he an investor? Now to Mark, this is an imperfect question. And although he acknowledges by traditional standards, he's definitely a trader. He argues that we're all traders. We all sell eventually. And most self-proclaimed long-term investors overlook the degree to which they are traders too. But semantics aside though, Let's focus on Mark's framework and process. For Mark, it all starts with the charts. Before anything enters his portfolio, the technicals must align in a way that leads Mark to believe there is a favorable risk reward. And it's important to highlight that he believes the technicals are the symptoms and not the cause of price moves. Plus, most charts are just noise anyway, and rather than try and force an outcome onto every chart, most of the time, he concludes that it provides no info and he's on to the next one. Each day he's manually examining hundreds of charts and now, over the years, he's built up an understanding of exactly what he wants to see in a chart. As he goes through them, they get sorted out into different lists based on what he has seen. Now this focus on technicals doesn't mean that Mark writes off fundamentals, only that if the technicals aren't there, then the fundamental idea needs more time to mature before it makes it into the portfolio. If something does make it into the portfolio and it ends up not working out, it will never be held onto by Mark under the guise of it becoming an investment. If it's not working, it's out. Having said that, trades that do work out and have fundamental tailwinds can become investments. Some trend followers let these types of winning positions grow, only exiting after the trend has ended. But Mark is often taking some of the trade's profit off and funding this investment at zero cost by raising stops to break even or even higher. And this is because looking back over his trades, the ones where his timing has been right, he has been able to take some money off the table early and they have been his best investments regardless of his impressive entry point. There's also a fundamental aspect to what becomes an investment for him. Throughout history, the companies that have become the best investments are the high-flying technology companies of the day, as well as some consumer companies. So we've established that Mark likes trading around his positions. In fact, he believes that some of the best performing traders are those that have mastered this aspect in particular, i.e. sizing at the right moment. 
But up to now, we've only talked about taking money off the table to fund a longer term view. He also highlights how important it can be to recognize when you are seeing the ball well and bet bigger. Now, it's great to focus on what to do when you're doing well, but in the next section, we're going to turn our focus towards how Mark handles periods of bad performance, individual bad trades, and dealing with the emotions that accompany both of those. Let's take a look. So I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier, which was if one of your position takes a big hit, and um, I mean, I know you have very tight stop losses. It's not something that, you, uh, that typically happens to you, but for people watching, it's like, when does something that was a trade become an investment? And then how do you stay unemotional about things? Because um, on the, if you do have a losing position and you're like, well, hang on, if I rethink this, then maybe I can come up with a better reason to own it, but it's a different reason, or, or then you're just kidding yourself. So how do you stay, keep emotion out of it? Sure. Well, my biggest losses um, tend to actually come from winners, meaning right. they're givebacks on positions that are, so are those, you know, they're not, I should say my biggest drawdowns, they're not losses, mm. which is, as far as I'm concerned, managing losses is the easy part of the game. Managing winners is the hard part because you get this position that's working and it gets too big. Mm. And then how, and if it pulls back on you, now all of a sudden, it, it's putting too big of a dent into the overall P&L of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's where I spend a lot of my time. If something hits a stop loss, it's, it is a cost of doing business. Right. Period. End of story. Now, it, whatever people do uh, to convince themselves to stick with stuff, like, that is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. In my opinion, and the stuff. But I, I, but it's a, it's a lesson that's really important to learn, I think, because people. Put it this way, I have literally friends of mine who are in the stock market and you know something's not going against them and then they just try and tell themselves better stories to, to give this, when actually you need to kind of re-look at it from a very objective point of view. And generally this is a psych psychological issue. Yeah. So the one I hear, one of my favorite examples is, so let, let's say I, I, you and I like the same stock mm -hmm. and I like it, we both like it at 50 and it, I go, but look, if, if it goes to 45, you need to get out. It goes to 45, and you don't, and I do. Uh, and then six months later, it's at 30. And you call me back, you call me back or whatever, and we're talking about this. And yeah. your answer, inevitably, I've heard this so many times, is I'm waiting for it to come back to even. I'll get out right. when I'm at even. Because there's that psychological thing that I don't want to book a loss on something. Why? Oh, yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is part makes of the... It makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense, and people do this all the time. Even professionals. They'll carry inventory in their portfolio. Uh, they're, they're nursing a dog right. when, when they should just cut the position yeah. and, and reallocate that capital. But the way I, I usually frame it for people is like, okay, if I brought you an idea and I said, best case scenario, you, lose, you make nothing, and worst case scenario, you lose everything you put into it, would you take it? <laughs> of course, everyone says no, but it's like, that is effectively what you're doing right, right now. Uh, Saying, I'm just waiting around to break even. Are you right? <laughs> just get out. Uh, but the reason the reasons we do that is it must be psychological. Yeah. We don't like to admit we're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't like the way it feels to take a loss. Yeah, all those kinds of things. But what about? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it's easier to talk about the good times. But uh, do you ever have when you're in a, when you're in a rough patch? And I you and me were, were talking about this earlier. You almost need to try and trade yourself a little bit. So when you're on a good streak and your confidence is high and you're feeling good about you know health wise, you know you put your but on the accelerator a little bit. Um, and do you sort of you know, judge yourself a bit and go, you know what, I'm just not seeing the ball at the moment, I'll, I'll take all my risks down. Do you do those kind of things? Absolutely, and this is highly, I think, misunderstood and really underrated. So I think the best traders I know know when they're hot. Right. And they are riding the gas, but they're quick to move to the brake when they feel like I'm out of sync. Right. And part of this, it's, there's a psychological side to it for sure. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't think that your emotions are gonna play into the decisions you make, you're just fooling yourself. You've gotta have that a sense of humility really, I guess, Abs self-awareness. Abs self-awareness, but I think the other part of it though is the distribution of the way trades work out. Mm. Wins tend to come in bunches often. Everybody thinks if there's a 50-50 distribution yeah. that it's heads, tails, heads, tails. It's yeah. not. Yeah. And you run some of these random distributions, you can get so far away from 50-50, people will think the coin's broken. 
Yeah. Oh, it's not a real 50-50 coin. This thing's loaded. Yeah. <laughs> but it comes back. Yeah. So what, what that tells me is you have to trade smaller when things are not working. Yeah. And what, what most people have a really hard time with, though, is trading bigger when things are working. Why? Because, well, I had one, this is working and that's working. I'm worried I'm going to give it back. Mm-hmm. And I take the opposite view. Mm. I'm willing to risk what I made on the first two mm. to roll it up because I think everything is lining up. And that's what takes, I think that's what takes the most time and something I'm, we're still working at all the time is to say, are we being aggressive enough right here? Yeah. And we only are going to get aggressive on the heels of success. That's also how you keep yourself from digging a bigger hole. Because what <clears throat> something I was thinking about earlier is people seem to have this extraordinary amounts of confidence about certain stocks sometimes. But a stock is pretty much at a price because <clears throat> there's decent reasons why it should go up and decent reasons why it should go down. I'm not so sure there's ever a, there's no such thing as a no-brainer. People used to say that all the time, but uh, that was a recipe for a disaster. Sure. But um, what I'm saying is the margins can be so small about winning or losing on a trade that it's these other things like knowing when you're hot and when you're not uh, and when and how to size that can really make the difference between, you know, a 5% return and a 15% return. So that, those are kind of things that I think it sounds like you know, you, you've taught yourself all of these things, but it's something really important to recognize for any investor or trader out there. Sure, and one of the things, so uh, there's a couple, couple of, uh, I guess, almost like mental questions or rehearsals like, that we go through, and talking about myself and my co-portfolio manager, Brandon, and one is to say, okay, if we do this a thousand times, mm-hmm. where are we? Uh, if you don't have an answer to that question or you're not sure, you shouldn't put it on. Right. There are plenty of times I put on stuff that I go, I know if I put money on the line in this situation, to your point, this, this no-brainer. There's no such thing as a no-brainer. Right. But if the, the, expect, the expectancy is, say, two to one on a 50-50, if mm-hmm. I do that a thousand times, yeah. I'm way ahead. I'm not yeah. just ahead, I'm, yeah. I'm a long ways ahead. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. You and know. I think another way to look at it is like, if in a week's time I look back and I still would have done the same thing, it sounds like a good idea. Another, you, yeah, another think, reason to track your trades that's as right. well. Or yeah. you, and, and to me, this whole this vernacular about trades, investments, like, some of this is semantics. Like I've heard people say before even, like, well, you know, oh, Richie's a trader. It's like, as opposed to what? We're all speculating here. At some yeah. point, everybody's going to sell something. Yeah. You're going to hold everything to your dead. You're still going to sell it then. <laughs> yeah. like, and we're all, we're all sellers at some point, and we yeah. all have to have rules for how yeah. we handle stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing, though, that we often ask, and this is more in periods where either it's, a, it's been a little more challenging or in terms of sometimes even sizing, to say, okay, what's going to bother us more? Let's mm-hmm. say I like this position, or I want to own this, mm-hmm. um, but I'm a little uneasy about it. Maybe because things haven't been going very well, uh, or you know, our, the market's maybe in a more difficult period. Just get some on the sheet? Just type <clears throat> a little bit? Well, I, ask yourself the honest question. What's going to bother me more? Passing on it altogether and watching it go higher without me, or lower if you were shorting it, whatever. Right. Or taking the position of losing money. Yeah. And that will tell you where you're actually at That's in good. terms of protecting your own confidence. Mm-hmm. Because once, once you start really blowing up your confidence, then you won't be able to take shots that you know you should take. Right. And, but what it does is it helps you be more selective, especially in a period where, it's not, where things just don't seem to be working. You get pickier and pickier until you see that situation where you just go, well, I have to, I have to play here. Um, now, part of that's a process of, of refining and being... Uh, a little bit honest with yourself, yeah. But everybody's got a point where they go, "I'm just tired of losing money," uh, in a, in oh, a yeah. losing period, yeah. Where you get more and more selective. So, so you sound like you, you you stay very you stay very liquid in all the names. You want to be able to get in and out when you can. What about number of positions? Do you have like a set number in your head, and you think like <laughs> this is a nice digestible amount for me, or is it just if it's a good idea, it's, it goes in? Well, and this is where you know I can, I can go from cash to fully invested really quickly, and I have at times. Right. And Which, by the way, and vice very, versa. It's a very comforting thing to know that. Do you know what I mean? What? It's like I remember I was in, you know, I'd be in some positions thinking it would just take me two or three days to get out of this, and just sleeping on that, you know, is something that sits at the back of your mind. But knowing that you could basically take your whole portfolio down to zero in one day, there's there's value in that. Sure. And and and. 
normally if I'm going to take the portfolio down to zero, it's because you know either some things are are hitting stops or I'm I'm basically I'm being forced into cash. Uh-huh. So I try and bend with the market, you know, if and when I can. I'm not going to argue with it. Do you do you look at the volatility of the market and then adjust the sizing of your portfolio accordingly? So I mean, if we're in a pretty stable environment, then you'll you'll be happier with bigger positions. And then you know, let's say something like COVID happens, you'll you'll just quickly reduce because of the volatility increase. Yeah, COVID's a good example of where you know we I was in cash days off the highs. Why? Because my universe started trading really poorly. Right. So the antenna immediately went up to say... Let's just watch. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a generally a volatility trader. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I don't try and pick bottoms. I've, ju- I've done better even not trying to short. I've done a little shorting over the years, made some money, but I find it just takes my focus off the better ideas that are going to then subsequently set up at the long side. So... Yeah. Keeping the powder dry has been a better strategy for me, even if I have to sit for sometimes months. That's another mm-hmm. point that I think most people realize. Sometimes there's nothing to do, Jamie. Yeah. Well, you don't t- have to trade. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, the reality is everyone now, because you can get onto some of these brokers and trade any security, any commodity, anywhere on the planet, they yeah. think they have to. That's yeah. a huge mistake. Yeah. You're better off. It takes a lot of discipline to t- do nothing. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a good chunk of this year, I've, I've been underinvested even while the S&P's ground higher. And some people might say, that, you know, that guy's an idiot or whatever. It doesn't bother me one bit, because I, I, if, if things don't meet my criteria, I'm not gonna play. And I'm not gonna get aggressive right. unless I'm seeing you know, what I need to see. So that's an interesting one, because um, we've spoken to other people who've been on masterclasses, and um, they have their rules and they have their strategies, and they feel like they've really, they've been tempted out of it. And they've lost money there. Um, I won't go into their names, but I think there's a few others who've done this. Have you ever just slipped up somehow and said, you know what, I just broke my own rule there and I really regret it? Well, style drift, I think, is what you just sort of described in terms of, you know, have you, have you completely veered away um, from your style? I would say in that regard, maybe, maybe certainly in regards to trying setups or or ideas that are less lesser quality mm-hmm. to my point before rather than just waiting for that idea where i say listen i know if i, I have to take this yeah um but there are times where you know either it, it could be because you're in a good period and yeah. and everything's working mm-hmm. so you know <laughs> why not why not you yeah know yeah, I mean? yeah and that's, that's usually true. that's usually a recipe for taking a good period and turning it into a, that's <laughs> a true, mediocre actually. period yeah um but when it comes to hard rules, um, no. Meaning, like, I never break discipline when it comes to managing stop risk. Stop losses. Stop or, losses. You know, right. like that fun. If you, don't have, if you don't follow rules, you don't have rules. Yeah. And, you know, there's that old, have you seen that old uh, scene in the Ghostbusters where uh, they're hanging out at Sigourney Weaver's house and he says, I have a rule never to sleep with a woman on the first date. <laughs> yeah. And she throws him on the bed and he goes, well, it's more of a guideline than a rule. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. like, I jokingly say that. It's like, if you don't have rules, you just have guidelines. And guidelines go out the window yeah. once you're in the heat of battle yeah. to say, there are, there are some things we never, ever break. One mm. is, if I said I was getting out at XYZ price, and then I'm getting out. Now I can reevaluate. That's the that's the beauty of getting out too. You can think clearly now. Right. True. <laughs> if it, because I can decide is, to get back in then and follow that plan to say, well, okay, where rather than to your point earlier about why don't I invent another thesis and a narrative that allows me to stay in a position that I that I originally said I wouldn't be in at this price. Yeah. I'm almost thinking now that you said that, like if if you have a position on and you're unable to think clearly about it, take it off the book. And then just rethink because it's at that point where you really know that you've got no skin in the game. Because as soon as you have a position on, at the back of your mind, you may be you may be biased. Exactly right. Exactly. It's so easy to focus on identifying good investments that sometimes we forget one of the most important factors for long-term success: damage control. When it comes to individual positions, Mark has no problem taking losses. In fact, he says that managing losses is the easy part of the game. You set your sell price and you stick to it. Sometimes you may gap down through that price, but the resulting decision is still the same for Mark. Get out of the position. 
Winners, though, are much tougher to manage as some of the largest drawdowns and P&L swings happen in positions that he would classify as already being a winner. This is very similar to what some of the CTA traders like Eric Crittenden or Jerry Parker have talked about in their masterclasses, where the biggest swings are occurring on positions that are in the money and are given more room to swing around. Reassessing losing trades is also very important to Mark. Often, after a losing trade, it's easy to feel down and ask yourself how you could have done something so stupid. But as you get more experienced, you understand that losing trades are just the cost of doing business. Mark is asking himself, if he's done that trade a thousand times, is he going to come up on top or not? If the answer is yes, then even a losing trade can be classified as a good trade. Sometimes bad trades happen when you're having success. But as Mark points out, winners and losers have an interesting habit of clustering together and you're likely to go through many periods where it seems like everything you are doing is wrong. These periods of poor performance can be debilitating if not handled appropriately. The key is recognition. You need to recognize when you have it and when you don't. As we discussed earlier, knowing when to press on the gas can be hugely important for generating exceptional returns. But perhaps more important is taking your foot off the gas if you aren't trading well or if the market isn't providing you with the right opportunities tempting you into lower quality ideas. Be sure not to fall into that trap. Mark isn't trying to force anything on the market. If it isn't providing him with what he wants, he's going to remain underinvested. He cites the market in 2021 as one that forced him into less capital at play, despite markets climbing higher. It's easy to get sucked in when this happens, but as Mark says, if you don't follow rules, then you don't have rules. Another point I'd like to highlight is what Mark said about protecting your confidence. Trading from a place of fear or underconfidence is a recipe for disaster. And when things aren't going your way, you need to ask yourself, what is more detrimental to your confidence? Is not trading and missing a move going to do more damage or is making a trade and taking a loss? It's never easy to say with these sorts of psychological questions, but it highlights that you really have two capital bases. One being your literal capital and the other being psychological capital. And both need to be protected. Um, so, Mark, we've talked about, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about idea generation because sure. I feel we, we, uh, we could do more there. So when you have, first of all, how do you use research? I mean, do you use the sell side? Uh, do you speak to people on the buy side? Uh, like, how do you get your ideas? Where do you get your information from? Sure. A little bit of, a little bit of everywhere. And mm -hmm. I've shared, it, at least in, on the fundamental side, uh -huh. as I said before. So I'm looking for an argument, if you will, speaking as former, former philosophy students, yeah. that, that makes sense to me, meaning premises that hopefully lead to a conclusion yeah. that is potentially interesting on the fundamental side. Why, to your point, if everything's, if everything's equally available in the market, why should it go up? Mm -hmm. Or why should it go down? Mm. Um, and so that's part of it. And then it's, it's really just kind of thinking about stuff creatively and critically mm -hmm. to say, and, and this is, you know, this is really, there are so many different specialties that come through on Real Vision every now and again. Yeah. And then you hear somebody talking about a niche area and it's like, oh, interesting. I haven't, I haven't heard of that one before. Right. Uh, and there's been a number of ideas like that, that then either you start, that kind of gets the creative right. juices flowing. So then maybe I'll put it on um, another watch list yeah. to say, well, once the technicals line up, that gives me a little more conviction because I have an understanding of what's going on. Uranium yeah. would be like an example where yeah. there were just a number of guests over the years. Mm -hmm. It took a long time for the technicals on uranium to not look like absolute garbage <laughs> because it was just in this, you know, forever. Just drifting. Yeah, dr lower. Drifting lower. Yeah. You know, well, if you look over the last 18 months, it has subsequently been much more in my wheelhouse. So I'm, I've been much more aggressive trading around a few positions mm -hmm. here and there. 
uh, as they set up. Well, knowing that, that hey, this has a fundamental tailwind mm. uh, based upon other people's work who's smarter than me, again, to my point before, it's mine to have people that are smarter than you. Yeah. Use their work to your advantage if, right. and, where, if and where it fits. Um, and because I'm not a fundamental specialist, I, I'm, I'm really just sort of a synchronizer of, of, of both. Um, and, and it's the same even in terms of equities, to say, well, why, why, for example, is this area in technology mm-hmm. just red hot? Mm-hmm. Um, and are there drivers there that we don't fully understand? Mm-hmm. And versus, say, something that the minute the momentum breaks, I want to be out of this thing. You right, know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Where other, you know, other positions to say, well, maybe I, again, assuming I'm in a profit and playing from a position of strength that I want to try and, and stick with. Right. Um, but normally, it's we're going to run through our, we have a set number of screens in terms of idea generation. And this mm-hmm. is true whether it's something I'm just trading or it's something I'm trading and then looking to play for a, a bigger move. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's going to come out of that. Mm. I don't determine it. I, I, it's, I'm trying to let the market say what's holding up the best, what's showing the best earnings and sales, and then I'll go from there. And this is how I tend to formulate my overall view on the, on the general market. People right. are like, well, why, why are you cautious in the general market? Well, I don't like the way some of the higher growth groups are trading, which means there's not a lot of people who want to take risk. Right. It doesn't mean I, I think the market's going to crash. It just goes, I'm not as, I'm not as apt to, to be as aggressive because I'm not seeing what again, what my process is, is telling mm-hmm. me I need to see. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, to some of those growth groups from before, well, like for example, right now, everyone's talking metaverse, uh, especially in the crypto land and all that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. Well, there are only a couple of equities that I'm aware of that are supplying software that's gonna go into some of these 2D, 3D mm-hmm. areas. So I'm watching those very closely. Right. So if they, if they start to meet the technical... Yep. Entry Break point out. that I'm looking for, mm-hmm. I'm going to be that much more aggressive, or I'm going to be that much more apt to say I'm going to try and play this for a bigger move because yeah. I think there's something a, a secular driver here yeah. that is that I'd be crazy to sell it up 15 the whole just unload the whole position at two or three to one. Yeah. No, I'm going to go for a ten to one. Yeah. You know something that can really move the needle. Um, and now every now and again though too, you hear of an idea, um, and this was a number of years ago. Long before the whole, I think it was on Real Vision, there was somebody talking about U.S. pot stocks. And this was like 2017, not right. the run we saw last year. Definite fad. Well, right. And so I started to do a little bit of work on it and think about it. And sure enough, then they started to set up technically. And it was just like, that's an area that even like our screens wouldn't have normally caught. Sure. And actually, it didn't even have, some of those weren't even like list, publicly listed on U.S. exchanges yet <laughs> and those types of things. Yeah extremely uh, great example of the same timeless principles though um, so I, I was going to ask because I'm paraphrasing a little about what what you're saying here because um, when I was doing portfolio manager, management uh, fundamental analysis was really what you could hang your hat on it was like have a price target that gave you the conviction to trade up and down but it sounds like you are much happier to be a, um, a convergence of different kind of styles which is uh, maybe the kind of world we're in now, because there may be, a, you know, whether it's trading memes, you've got to be open to the idea that there are other things that are going to affect stocks, and you just have to be open-minded. Well, I think, I think we're seeing that right now in terms of even social media right. intent mentions and things like that. If you don't think that at some point that might not translate to the bottom line, if everybody's talking about a product on, right. on Facebook and Twitter, I can promise you, yeah. at some point, it may work its way into the earnings. In the same way, if everybody is dogging a product, look at Beyond Meat. You right, know, that I thing know. is just like, there's just nothing but negative from what I understand. So I'll read those types of things. Yeah. Um, just, but do, do you have a way of like filtering through social media to see what's, what's buzzing on the internet and what isn't? Yeah, so uh, there, there's one, um, I like Folio is what it's called, that we, they're, they're kind of a retail, just to, just right. that tracks uh, uh-huh. consumer mentions. I'll look at that along with, um, like I would never base a trade just on that. Again, I'm gonna wanna see the technicals line up, or let's say there's a company I'm holding and uh-huh. I'm debating whether or not to hold into earnings. If, yeah. it, if it has a strong social mention and presence, I'm more apt to hold that into earnings. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's like, um, it's, it's another nuance that, that I kind of add to things. But the thing I would say with, with, all, with a lot of these things, and what I'd encourage folks you know, that are 
trying to do this themselves on some level mm -hmm. is there there at points needs to be something where you kind of have these aha moments yeah where you're like I saw this and I saw this and that and the stars align it, did they well did they uh, oh. or am I fooling myself and have I seen this before uh -huh. uh, and then every now and again you kind of see that again so to your point before it's, it's it is a convergence that's yeah. a good way of it's like a sandwiching mm -hmm. of a number of things and sometimes it can even be you know, um, like David Ryan, who who's a, a friend of a Mark Minervini's, and you know, I've gotten to know him over the years as well. Legendary growth manager. He was in Market Wizards as well. He goes to some of these newer retail shops. Yeah. And how many people are in there? He talks to the people that are the customers. Just wow. kind of, just kind of, just you know, anecdotally yeah. probing around. Because it's a pretty decent getting know, a feel for the place. And yeah. A good example though was you know, early on in my career one of my, I was actually at a holiday thing talking to one of my uncles and he was like all right you know mr. upstart like yeah. and this is somebody who's been real uh, successful in the market right what, what, what do you like and I was like well, my biggest position right now was lululemon the, the, oh, yeah. the he was like yoga pants actually like what are you nuts this thing's way overvalued it's a dead short uh, remember my point before about not yeah. being afraid to go against people who are smarter and oh, wealthier sure. than you yeah and the reason was huge earnings and sales, technicals met all my criteria. And then I happened to be like working out at a gym where everybody was wearing the clothes, talking about it. And there was a point where a whole bunch of people took off work just to go to try and get some of their clothes when they were having like a sale at the Allstate Arena, like in the parking lot. Right. And they told me the line was so long, Ugh. like it was backed up off the exits onto the highway. That's how many people had left work to go and try and get a discount and on, think if on yoga pants. And if it's happening here, I bet you it's <laughs> happening it's going on. A, yeah. yeah, well, long story short, that stock went a lot higher. Um, but every now and again, you kind of have these things where everything sort of converges. My point earlier about the US multi-state operators. A year ago, during COVID, freezing cold outside here, they opened one of these dispensaries that uh, a company I, I happen to be long yeah. owned near Woodfield Mall, 20 miles from here, one of the uh -huh. biggest malls in Chicagoland. And it was, and I, I wanted to go just go inside the store just to see it. And my wife was like, we were out there, she's like, we're not. I'm like, there was a line out the door to the freezing cold. She's like, we're not getting in that line. <laughs> like, not to mention, I don't want to be caught dead walking into one of these shops. <laughs> and I was like, but it, again, it was like everything aligned, technicals. Yeah. The, the, the fundamental argument and the fact that, to your point, if people are waiting in the freezing cold in Chicago at one of these places, uh, they're buying this stuff like mm. crazy. And so every now and again, you kind of have those, it doesn't have, to, it doesn't have to be like I just described, but you right. have these moments to say, all right, this is going to increase my conviction, mm -hmm. help me to stick with it. And it, part of it is just intuitive pattern recognition, I think, before. And the other thing is that nowadays, I mean, 10, 20 years ago, there wasn't as much data available in terms of consumer behavior. But now, you know, I don't know how easily it is available to you, but you can just see so clearly where people are spending their money. And, you know, there's so many things that that, you know, there's, there's other ways of getting data and research other than reading a, a sell side research report, which, to be honest, maybe a little backward looking anyway. But there's a lot of like real time data out there that you can focus on. Certainly, certainly. And, and look, the the reality is there is no perfect process. Mm. Like if you're after perfection in terms of like, I've, you're gonna see everything ahead of time, <laughs> that's not the case. I wish I could tell you every, everyone that has lots of consumer mentions or whatever, or, or even if they have bigger earnings and sales, that means yeah. th these stocks are going to the moon. Yeah. No, to the 50, 80 rule, uh, before maybe you're the last buyer, right? And so you have to. It's usually me, by the way. <laughs> well, you need to have a rule for, <laughs> for yeah, how and when you're you're gonna you know duck and cover. So here we get a bit more clarity on idea generation on both the fundamental and the technical side. Mark's system can be best described by two phrases: intuitive pattern recognition and convergence of confidence. There's no perfect technical setup that Mark can provide or a list of four fundamental factors that when you see all four, you know the company is a buy. But after years of trading, looking at millions of charts and countless earnings seasons, Mark is able to recognize patterns that give him an idea of risk reward. He's getting ideas from research he is reading, his own observations of the world around him, and even from watching Real Vision. 
He cites both cannabis MSOs and uranium as two ideas where the kernel of the fundamental thesis came from watching Real Vision and listening to others. The technicals weren't right when he first heard the ideas, but these good fundamental theses go onto a watch list until that convergence of confidence occurs. Now, you can't go kick the tires at a nuclear plant or sit on the types of high-level discussions that may determine if nuclear energy becomes a bigger part of the green energy roadmap. But you can pay attention to media, both social and traditional, for an additional level of confidence convergence. This is even more true for consumer goods, as you can pay attention to chatter online, but also in many cases see real-world examples of popularity at physical stores. A line out the door is not enough for Mark to initiate a trade, but it is yet another layer of conviction which may help him hold on to a position longer or through potentially turbulent events like earnings. In some cases, though, the opposite might be occurring where the sentiment is poor. That doesn't mean Mark won't take a trade in something with strong technicals, but if all the sentiment around the company or product is negative, that means he will be more cautious about changes in momentum or in carrying larger positions into earnings. Mark has some services he uses to track sentiment and chatter around consumer products, but there is, unfortunately, no formula. As you can see, much of Mark's process has been developed through years of practice and experience, and that's one of the key takeaways from all of this. Unless you're being truly quantitative and systematic with an automated strategy, there is no substitute for real-world trading experience and the knowledge and confidence that you accrue over time. Uh, Mark, you have, you've outlined so many interesting things about your process, and I think everyone's going to have learned so much. But I wanted to ask about your, um, I was going to say your personal life, but that sounds a bit intrusive. What I mean is, how do you structure your day so that you, you know, stay balanced, so that you can think objectively about your portfolio, whether it's sleep or whether it's health <laughs> or it's what you eat? Or I mean, I know you already said you have five children, so I'm fascinated how you do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Ed, yeah, when I got, I got started, I had... Uh, no, no capital, no money, uh, two small kids and two on the way. So if you want to talk oh, about, man. you want to talk about stress and pressure. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a combination of a number of things and continuing to grow and mature, I hope. Mm -hmm. Um, but so the first thing there's a, there's a, there's a book uh, called Oikonomics by a guy named Mike Breen. Uh, I, I'll get into one of the things that I've really kind of latched on to his philosophy, but one of the things he talks about in one of his other books is this idea of how do you work from a place of rest? And so he draws like a pendulum. Right. Where it's, it's work on one side and it's rest on the other. And he was, his, his idea is most people work into the point where they need to rest, but they're mm. not really rested mm. in terms of like their regular rhythms. So their minds aren't clear they're not really healthy, um, or they're not, they're not maybe making as otherwise a good of decisions as maybe they could be, um, or, or as attentive to all the things that are going on in our lives, right? Um, so that's one that about maybe five or six years ago, I read, or I ran kind of into head-on collision with, maybe I need to slow down and recalibrate what rest really looks like, both wow. in, in smaller, frames and bigger it wasn't that i wouldn't take a day off but i i you know was as guilty as as anybody else of just kind of being aggressive and going after stuff it was sure. i was getting four or five hours of sleep a night and right. yeah too many so how, so how did too, you do it too many kids and all that kind of stuff <laughs> well i, I kind of realized like i have i've got to make some real changes and it happened to coincide with what was a a little bit of a tougher period in the market as well right um and so just instituting some different disciplines. So one of the things I do every single day, I've always done this, um, is I have, you know, just kind of personal quiet time yep. every single morning. Yeah. Could be five minutes. Ideally, it's 30. Yeah. Um, I, I won't get overly spiritual if you don't want me to, but, you know, that's part of my own, like, personal Christian devotional time. But I think, I mean, I know people that, that don't ascribe to the same faith camp at all that still practice silence and oh, solitude. Meditation. Meditation, whatever, whatever TM, all mm -hmm. those, I mean... I don't know much about those things, but I know the, the value of, of quieting your mind is really good. I also do that sometimes in the middle of the day. And then even in this last season, my wife and I have been trying 
um, to take almost like what would be considered like a classical Sabbath. What does it look like to take a day on the weekend to say we're at and least you can switch going switch off a phone? Uh, I well, I, if, if it were up to me, I would throw my phone away and never. I, I'm not a smartphone guy. That's not the temptation <laughs> to be. Mine is is my mind. I just have yeah. to quiet my mind down because uh-huh. I could sit there and be thinking. I could be talking to you. You know, if we're out to coffee, and I could be thinking about three positions I got on, or oh whatever, God. and just Are you doing need, that now. No, no, no. <laughs> but just you know, the the need to quiet yourself down. Yeah, um, it's tough to do because you know markets are so so engaging. I mean, there's always something going on. And actually, someone mentioned to me, they're like, "Oh, why are the markets only open from nine thirty to four and not on weekends?" I'm like, "Thank God." Right. I mean, well, imagine this, if, and the crypto <laughs> thing is not making anybody's know, lives any easier. If that starts to be seven days a week, then right. I don't know. So I think the value of rest is uh, super under mm-hmm. appreciated. Um, so I, I kind of even made a rule too that I, I am going to spend at yeah. least seven hours in bed mm-hmm. every single day. Yeah. Um, and that that is that has paid real dividends and you know as i've gotten as i've gotten older it, it's i you know i'm not that old but like the things the things you could do in your late 30s are not the things you can do in your mid 20s which mm-hmm. aren't the things you could do in your late teens oh i'm, I'm learning that the so health way. and nutrition is another yeah. thing of course yeah. and this kind of you know bleeds into a a bigger conversation one of the one of the books we we recommend um, is called Oikonomics. It's like three bucks. Yeah, yeah. It's a tiny little thin read on money. Mm-hmm. Skip all the chapters, mm-hmm. but read the one chapter on what he calls the five capitals. That is kind of like my philosophy for. Can you give us a quick? Yeah, I, yeah, I will. Basically, his point is: listen, most people focus on one area. So he he breaks it down as there's there's financial capital, like we're talking about. How do you make money? Yeah. Um, but then there's your physical capital. There's your intellectual capital. Mm. Like, what is your capacity to continue to learn and retain knowledge? Yeah. How is your body doing your health? Relational capital, uh, relationships, and then spiritual capital in terms yeah. of like the actual state of your soul. Um, as you got to feel good about yourself. As a wise man once said, yeah, what, what does it benefit someone to earn the world forfeit their soul? But I think what we see, why are the wealthy so miserable? Statistically speaking, high suicidality rates, depression, anxiety among the wealthy. Why? I would argue it's because they have sacrificed they the other capitals right. for financial capital. Right. Their relational capital. Right. Multiple marriages. Right. The children hate them. Uh, you know, these types of things. So we do uh, need to think about returns, not just financial returns, you know. Well, how do, we, you how do we gauge true wealth? I mean, that's, that, that may have to be <laughs> well, for another well, time. I mean, so, so keeping those things in proper perspective, or how yeah. many people, uh, you know, deteriorate their physical health either too much stress, too much, mm-hmm. uh, too much work, or then, you know, they, they pacify themselves with unhealthy other yeah. habits. Yeah, you sure. Know, well, drugs just, and alcohol. I mean, we, the list could go on, and yeah. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I'm saying that has been a really healthy way mm-hmm. that we kind of talk even, in, it's really, you know, Brandon and myself, about saying like, well, okay, if we're not making new highs in financial capital, are we learning more? Right. How's our intellectual capital? Right. How's our relational capital? You can look at this even in terms of like, if you run a business, like, our, what's your network? Are, are you growing in, in contacts and mm-hmm. those types of things? Obviously, you should be looking at that in terms of your important relationships. Um, but that's also kept me going, even in periods to say, especially early on. People, they throw in the towel too early. Mm. On anything, by mm-hmm. the way, that's just, yeah. this is. I don't care what the business is. It takes uh, ten years to be an overnight success. Well, it, that's Tony Robbins. I think famously said, most people overestimate what they can do in one year and un- underestimate what they can do in ten. Same thing you just said. Right. Yeah. Um, well, what kept me going early on was to say maybe I was in a period where I, it was I wasn't making much money or I was in a drawdown. It, what would I've lo- look at all that I've learned? It'd be crazier to quit now, given everything I've learned. Right. Um, so just because Even the, in the, the intellectual cap- capital was making new highs right. while, while the financial capital hadn't caught up yet. You learn fastest when you're making mistakes. You're like, I don't want to do that again. Sure. Yeah. And, and why, you know, I look at even, even some of the other people I've had the privilege of learning from in terms of relational capital. Yeah. You know, guys like Mark Minervini have had a huge impact. I mean, Peter Brandt, who I didn't even mention, um, in some ways taught me some things that were just invaluable. Right. Um, and other traders that you know, I've gotten to know over the years that I really respect where that's a massive increase in terms of, of both intellectual and relational capital. Mm-hmm. So just kind of looking at things a little bit more 
holistically and yeah. keep, helps you keep things in perspective. We don't even get into the spiritual capital, as I said, but <laughs> I'll leave that to, you know, if, if people want to press me more on that, happy to talk about that as well. But I, I think to, to just focus on, on one yeah. um, is potentially a mistake. Because your return, you will lose money in finance, and if you've neglected the others, then then you're losing all that, So what was the point? Yeah, exactly. Then yeah. you're really lost. Yeah. Uh, well, Mark, you strike me as somebody who has got it right in all the kind of areas of life. So uh, I'm still. It is a work in process. <laughs> we're I, all I, still figuring it out. Yeah, I can tell you, this has been an extremely humbling journey, and you know, I think there's a, there's some other things too that most people don't appreciate in terms of regardless of where you start Mm -hmm. so i think there's probably a lot of people though will be encouraged to know that you can start small and the markets still provide a great opportunity but it takes hard work discipline perseverance Mm -hmm. you have to continue you know you know as as you described learn from your mistakes Mm -hmm. um to develop a, a process based on really good principles um and and the other thing though is like it doesn't matter how small you start. Um, I, I think there's so many people out there, well, it's not as good as it was in the 90s. Oh, you know, the 70s were better markets. Whatever. Like, that's nonsense. Um, right. And they'll be saying that, you know. I think every generation says that. And, what, what, they, was what, and what people, you know, listen, there were plenty of people who told me, don't, don't do this, don't go into this, I don't think you're cut out for this, or whatever. And what we're, most of those people are really saying is, uh, I couldn't do it, so you shouldn't try. Right. And no, I don't, I'm not saying that everybody's path is, is paved to gold and whatever they put their hands to, but if, if you, this is what you feel like you should really be doing, yeah. um, I, I do think the market still provides a great opportunity, and I'm kind of, that's, that's my story. Yeah. So. Well, Mark, it's a great story. I've hugely enjoyed chatting with you. Um, you know, everyone at Real Vision was so appreciative of the time you spent with us, and thank you. I, I hope this won't be the last time you're on. Ab- absolutely not. I love Real Vision. I love what you guys are doing. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much, Mark. Cheers, bud. Although for some like Mark, trading and investing is a full-time job, and for the rest of us, it is a huge part of how we plan to build for our future, it's important to highlight that it's only part of our lives. You can love trading for the challenge of it all, and many of the best do, but ultimately, it is a means to an end. Having some perspective on how your trading fits into a holistic and balanced life can improve your performance. Now for Mark, he's focused on having at least 30 minutes of quiet time for self-reflection, at least seven hours of sleep, and being mindful of the fact that his physical health, his family, and his friends are worth as much as his success in the markets. So that's it from me. And as always, please check out the detailed notes at the link in the description for deeper examinations of all the topics that we didn't have the time to cover here. As well, there are the books Mark mentioned, much more great content from him on Real Vision and other investor masterclasses for you to continue your journey of discovery. Did you know that we published detailed notes alongside every episode of the Investor Market?